Happy St. George's Day, chaps. Paul Curran here. 1564. On this day, 23rd of April, or certainly very close to it, William Shakespeare was born. He was baptised on the 26th of April in Holy Trinity Church. And uh, 52 years later, in 1616, he died on April the 23rd as well. William Shakespeare, what's known of him? Well, in the first folio, printed in 1623, after his death, there were 36 plays listed. Um, two uh, were, were sidelined uh, in Pericles and two noble kinsmen, and also Edward III from the histories. And uh, Shakespeare also wrote some longer poems, Venus and Adonis, The Rape of Lucrece, when the theatres were closed because of the plague earlier in his career, and um, he wrote 154 sonnets. Uh, John Keats thought that Shakespeare embodied the poetic character, um, the poetical character. Uh, he says, it is not itself, it has no self, it is everything and nothing. It has no character, it enjoys light and shade, it lives in gusto, be it foul or fair, high or low, right or poor, mean or elevated. It has as much delight in conceiving an Iago as an Imogen. What shocks the virtuous philosopher delights the chameleon poet. What has fascinated me as I've um, come to know and, and love the works of Shakespeare. Uh, it was, it's his role as an actor. He must have been, I think, a, a very accomplished actor, um, not just to have written so well for the stage, but because he worked as an actor from the 1580s onwards for 15 years. And um, I don't think um, the groundlings at the Globe uh, would have suffered fools gladly. Uh, he was in the Chamberlain's Men then. They later on um, became the King's Men, having received patronage from James I. But um, Shakespeare, I think, was a, was a, a very... Um, uh, he must have been an extremely um, observant individual. And um, I think the fact that he um, would have spent that time working with actors uh, and so on would have informed his, his writing without a shadow of a doubt. Uh, in his troupe were Will Kemp and um, Burbage. They were the, um, the, 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 the pin-ups, as it were, one for comedy and the other for his, his great tragedies. Talking of comedies and tragedies, people think of Shakespeare with um, history, comedy, tragedy. But the Gower Memorial in Stratford-upon-Avon, which was erected on the 10th of October 1888, has four of Shakespeare's characters uh, represented in statues around um, around him. He sits on high. The, the characters that are there are Prince Hal from the two Henry IV plays, Hamlet, Lady Macbeth and Sir John Falstaff. And they represent these elements. Lady Macbeth represents tragedy. Prince Hal represents history. Fat Sir John Falstaff, comedy, and Hamlet, philosophy. And the extraordinary thing about Shakespeare's writing is that he basically breathes life, uh, psychological um, depth into his characters. Uh, Alec Guinness, who did write some books, I think autobiography and um, and, uh, and other things, he. I'm sure I read that before he um, died, he'd been planning on writing a book about the um, fascination he had with the small parts in Shakespeare, um, because they are there, there are no really redundant roles in the canon. Um, it's not known too well which parts Shakespeare would have taken, but I think I've been told that he um, may have played the faithful servant Adam in As You Like It. Uh, and also possibly um, Hamlet's father. Um, I, I'm not 100% sure about that. Um, I like to think that he would have visited Coventry um, to see the mystery plays as a child, um, and uh, his 
education at the grammar school in Stratford would have introduced him to Plautus and Terence and uh, Ben Johnson said um, that he had, I think, some Latin and less Greek. Um, but he also was a great observer of nature and um, references to birds in, in um, Macbeth and uh, uh, King Lear. Uh, it is full of um, natural uh, references, which uh, coming from the centre of England would have been leafy Warwickshire. He would have been um, uh, very much aware of the changing seasons and fascinated by them, I'm sure. Anyway, perhaps the best way to demonstrate Shakespeare's genius is to uh, look at some of his work. And with the idea of him as an actor in mind, I thought today that I would um, first look at a very long soliloquy that appears in Act 2, Scene 2 of Hamlet, just to set the scene a little. Um, Hamlet, who's studying philosophy at Wittenberg University, um, has recently had to um, deal with the death of his father, the old king, and his uncle has um, assumed the throne and taken his mother as queen. Anyway, he's um, told that there's a ghost being seen, a ghost of his dead father, and he encounters the ghost, and the ghost tells him that, in fact, he was murdered. So Hamlet has all these things raging through his mind. And of course, ghosts were never a good thing. He would have learnt that in his university. Well, he invites the players into the castle. Um, they happen to be, be, be passing and they come to perform. And he's just heard them uh, deliver a speech. And he's astonished at their capacity to um, embody the roles that they're playing and even shed tears. And then he compares it to his inability to act um, given the information that he has and given the suspicions that he has. Um, this is from Act 2, Scene 2. Um, it's often referred to as the rogue and peasant slave soliloquy. Now I am alone. Oh, what a rogue and peasant slave am I. It's not monstrous that this player here, but in a fiction, a dream of passion, could force his soul so to his own conceit that from her working all his visage wand, tears in his eyes, distraction in his aspect, a broken voice, and his whole function suiting with forms to his conceit. And all for nothing, for, for Hecuba. What's Hecuba to him, or he to Hecuba, that he should weep for her? What would he do? Had he the motive and the cue for passion that I have, he would drown the stage with tears, cleave the general ear with horrid speech, make mad the guilty, appall the free, confound the ignorant, and amaze indeed the very faculties of eyes and ears. Yet I, a dull and muddy metalled rascal, peak like John of Dreams, I'm pregnant in my cause and can say no, nothing, no, not for a king upon whose property and most dear life a damned defeat was made. Am I a coward? Who calls me villain, breaks my pate across, tweaks me by the nose, gives me the lie of the throat as deep as to the lung? Swooned, I should take it, for it cannot be, but I am pigeon-livered, or ere this I would have fatted all the region's kites with this slave's awful, bloody, bawdy villain, remorseless, Lecherous, treacherous, kindless villain of oh, vengeance! <laughs> this is most brave, that I, the son of a dear father murdered, prompted to my revenge by heaven and hell, must, like a whore, unpack my heart with words and fall a cursing like a very drab, a scullion, fire pond. About my brains. I have heard. Guilty creatures, sitting at a play, have, by the very cunning of the scene, been struck so to the soul that presently they have proclaimed their malefactions. For murder, though it have no voice, will speak with excellent tongue. I'll have these players here play something like the murder of my father, 
before mine uncle. I'll observe his looks. I'll tent him to the quick. If he do blench, I know my course. For the spirit that I have seen may be the devil. I, and perhaps out of my weakness and my melancholy, abuses me to damn me. I'll have grounds more relative than this. The play's the thing wherein I'll catch the conscience of the king. And off he goes with renewed enthusiasm. Um, and he, he gets the players to, to uh, add something to their um, that evening's performance. And he plays it in front of um, uh, Claudius, the, his uncle. Uh, apologies there. I, I think I've missed a f <laughs> two or three lines out of that speech. It's a while since I've uh, uh, done it. But what a wonderful, um, uh, uh, you know, a wonderful moment in the play. And, it, of course, there's the, the communion, uh, the, the communion, the... Um, soliloquy it is a sense of communion really the audience knows that the actors are there speaking um uh, out loud in a way which most normal people don't find themselves doing but it's also um a bit but it's a, a theatrical device which allows the audience to really um uh, feel that they've had um, an intimate exchange with the, the principal characters and um hamlet really uh, is the character that um brought, uh, what's the best way to put it, he, he, he brought intelligence to, um, to the stage. Uh, he, he's an astonishing, astonishing char uh, character. Um, okay, so, the sonnets. Um, those listeners that have um, heard me during the last uh, several months um, reading some poetry will know that occasionally that I read some of my own, and I've written a, two books of sonnets. Um, I found one this morning, which I'll read now, which basically touches upon the, um, the wonder that I have for Shakespeare and um, uh, my experiences having acted in his plays in younger days. It's called Poetastic Magic. A poetaster uh, is a, essentially a, a poor poet, a, a bad poet. Poetastic Magic. What schoolboy songs, unwitless doggerel, antediluvian dilettante, I would, with sighing, singing, shout and shrill, of words in their range, rarely cognizant. Those other times, been given on bare stage, bardic, versified, lyrical wonder, there I could feel unmistakable rage, insight, power, immortally under his language aloft, in waltzing thin air, three ears spellbinding of those there to hear, prophesying war or regicide there, at once, history distant, newly near. Whether now released in language at last, where hides the magic he used for the task? I think it'd be difficult for me to say which is my favourite line from Shakespeare. Uh, I'm keen of Antonio's in um, uh, Twelfth Night, when he said, none can be called deformed, but the unkind. Uh, Henry V's, all things, all things are ready if our minds be so. Um, uh, there, there are some wonderful, um, wonderful lines. The most famous, to be or not to be, I think sums up um, Shakespeare's attitude to acting. Um, he discusses acting in, in Hamlet, um, but he, he advises um, that discretion um, should be the player's tutor when they're performing. Um, okay, but now there's a, an individual whose name crops up um, with infamy, really, alongside Shakespeare's, and that's Robert Greene, G-R-E-E-N with an E on the end. And his most famous uh, phrase of disparagement was he referred to Shakespeare as an upstart crow. What I hadn't realised until this morning um, is that he called Shakespeare that and, um, uh, and, and things worse, really, on his deathbed. And um, it was Robert Greene was, was a Cambridge uh, man of letters um, and uh, I think an intellectual snob. Uh, that goes uh, without, without some saying. And... Uh, Yes, I hadn't realised it was on his deathbed that he, he, he suggested Shakespeare was, was an upstart crow. Um, his publisher, 
uh, Henry Chettle, I think his name was, um, later on um, with, withdrew what um, um, Green had said, or he, he made out that he was um, uh, upset that Green had slandered Shakespeare uh, in the way that he does. Green wrote, um, For there is an upstart crow, beautified with our feathers, that with his tiger's heart wrapped in a player's hide, that's a quote from Shakespeare, from the third part of Henry VI. With his tiger's heart wrapped in a player's hide, supposes he is as well able to bombast out blank verse as the best of you. And being an absolute Johannes factotum, is in his own conceit the only shake scene in a country. Um, so really, I think that um, Robert Greene had a, 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 a chip on his shoulder, which... Um, Really, it's uh, it, it's going to stay with him throughout uh, throughout history. Someone recently told me that um, another phrase for which they think he is responsible uh, is to have one's guts for garters. Apparently, that was uh, Robert Greene as well. Um, now, I'd like to finish with, at the moment, my. Um, <laughs> My favourite Shakespeare sonnet. That tends to change as well. But um, this is a wonderful, a wonderful sonnet. And uh, in it, Shakespeare discusses um, his uh, sense of being an outcast. Uh, and uh, he, he references different things, which, if you look autobiographically, may refer to, um, in 1592, the closure of the theatres, um, which were uh, the, the um, bread and butter for, for Shakespeare and uh, his his troop of actors, um, and maybe even that um, that uh, Robert Greene um, comment was weighing on his mind. I don't know. Um, it, it's it's sometimes it can be enlightening looking at the autobiography as we know it, um, but it's not always um, a guarantee that that's that's where he was coming from. However, this sonnet I think is tremendous, and um, it's sonnet number twenty nine. When, in disgrace with fortune and men's eyes, I, all alone, beweep my outcast state, and trouble deaf heaven with my bootsless cries, and look upon myself and curse my fate, wishing me like to one more rich in hope, featured like him, like him with friends possessed, desiring this man's art and that man's scope, with what I most enjoy, contented least. Yet in these thoughts, myself almost despising, haply I think on thee, and then my state like to the lark at break of day arising, from sullen earth sings hymns at heaven's gate, for thy sweet love remembered such wealth brings, that then I scorn to change my state with kings. Happy birthday, Will. <laughs>